Welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag. I'm recording this uh, on January 11th, but it's playing on January 12th, 2018. I can't believe we've we've made it this far yet again. Uh, Ryan was unable to do mailbag, and so they chose me to do it for him. So we have a bunch of questions here, uh, probably far more than I really need, but, uh, you know, it's good for you. From Peter Jansen, other than moving... To a smaller node, in what ways can CPU be improved during a refresh? Also, what can we realistically expect from the Ryzen refresh? Well, there's quite a few things that any CPU manufacturer can do uh, other than a process node switch. If you figure that you've got a, a processor comprised of billions of transistors, the thing that keeps going into my head is there's more than one way to skin a cat, and this is exactly... The point is there's not just one way to be able to push instruction through a CPU. And so they can work on things uh, such as internal latencies. Um, they can, you know, widen pipelines. They can, they can increase pipeline stages. They can decrease pipeline stages. Uh, take, for example, what AMD did with going from bulldozer to pile driver. Um, AMD does a lot of automated place and route. And so... This essentially means that um, they, they kind of have the structures well-defined and then they use software to actually place and route the transistors and the wires in, in the CPU. Now, that is not the most efficient way of doing things. Uh, hand placement is a really intensive, labor intensive, but you can make things work a little bit better, well, sometimes a lot better. Uh, you can use less transistors, less die space, all of this stuff. But again, it costs a lot of money to hire an engineer to work 30 days on a simple PL loop. Um, that's what you're kind of looking for. So what AMD did is they went through their bulldozer design with a fine tooth comb and removed a lot of useless transistors that, you know, that may be not useless, but superfluous to uh, that design, they cut down the transistor budget. Uh, they were able to expand a couple other things to, to improve performance and uh, functions and features. But they really truly optimized the design and it came out a whole lot better. Uh, better in terms of actual TDP, uh, latencies, you know, how fast it is. It, it only, you know, that, that transition probably made, you know, one to 5% performance increase. But again, where it really, proved upon were the yields of the product and especially TDPs and how fast they were able to clock it. So what can I realistically expect from Ryzen refresh? I think that it did tell us that, that they did work on some of the memory latencies. So those are going to be improved. Uh, they've probably done some cleanup in the, the core design, um, maybe not as extreme as bulldozer to pile driver. But they've, they've obviously done some, and then the uh, switch to 12 nanometer is going to be able to give them, you know, a couple hundred extra megahertz. So I, my, my best guess is their top end is going to have a base clock 4 gigahertz with a boost of 4.4 to 4.6. I don't think that's too terribly out of line, but uh, we'll see if that actually happens. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it, and with uh, Intel's 10 nanometer issues... Um, and the kind of the roadmap falling off the map, uh, <laughs> it's it's going to be a good year, I think, for AMD. So it's going to be fun. Uh, White Zero asks, "What do you think that Intel can and will do to rebound from the meltdown, Spectre performance-wise? Do you think this opens the gap for AMD to slide into a stronger market presence as they are less vulnerable?" Um, so you know the the basic. Spectre problem is something that affects everybody, and that's that's just kind of the way the OSs um, handle speculative execution. And so everybody suffers from that. You can mitigate it through the OS and software patches, um, but it's the other two issues that I think that, that Intel has a problem with, but AMD does not. Or how does AMD say it is a near zero chance of them being affected by any single kind of, um, you know, bug in, in that. So you're going to see everybody from all sides try to approach the first thing 
uh, with hardware design changes, and that's going to take a while. Uh, so I don't know how bad it's going to be for Intel uh, because they they are hit harder it seems than AMD, but it's not AMD and ARM that that are totally unaffected. Uh, it's going to be kind of a case by case basis and uh, see what kind of uh, applications are are hit the hardest. Um, but you know, this is something that that AMD can utilize if they've done their homework and make sure that they're not actually going to get hit by a lot of these things or experience the same performance drop that that we've kind of been hearing horror stories stories uh, uh, from you know the server guys, especially a lot of uh, you know game back end and database stuff seems to be uh, affected quite a bit more. Um, and yeah, it's 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 going to open up some opportunities for AMD, especially with them trying to push Epic out now. And this couldn't have happened at a better time for AMD or a worse time than Intel. Uh, new budgets are coming out for the entire year. People are upgrading servers. Um, new applications are constantly being put out. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's bad timing for Intel. And we'll see we'll see how it goes. Prasanna Shinde said, what do you think the next big improvement or challenge will be for processors after manufacturers hit the wall in the nanometer shrink race? Um, boy, that's a good question. And it's something that people are, are struggling with and thinking about. And it's, uh, it's going to be quite a few years. And especially as we've seen from the jump from 20, 22 nanometer to 14 to 10, and how long this is taking. And yeah, Global Foundry supposedly has a seven nanometer product out, same with TSMC by the end of this year. But I would say overall, those are probably gonna be in terms of actual size and performance more in line with what Intel hopes their 10 nanometer process will be. I guess we'll find out. Um, everybody is getting more on the same page. Uh, Intel used to have a two to three year advantage over everybody else, and now that has obviously slipped. Uh, again, this year is going to be very, very interesting with other people putting out 12 nanometer parts, 10 nanometer parts uh, from Samsung and Global Foundries, 12 nanometer TSMC. Uh, it's going to be kind of one of the favorite ones for graphics, I believe. And then later on, 7 nanometer jump for TSMC, Global Foundries, um, Samsung's doing another 10. But we're not going to see that race over for at least another decade. I think the way that things are heading, it's just becoming so much more complex. And uh, we're going to see new materials be uh, put out. You know, we're going to do nanotubes and, and uh, more carbon based, probably, uh, transistors in the future that will allow um, transistor speed performance to improve. Uh, but we're going to be hitting some, some density issues. And that's going to be where good design is going to have to come into play. And I mean, we can look back at the 28 nanometer process and GPUs and see what Nvidia did from the first generation of products on that process. The what, 700 series, I believe. I think so. And then their 900 series, which showed a huge, a pretty significant increase in performance, but also a significant cut down in TDPs for that performance. And that's all still on the same 28 nanometer process. So um, they, everybody's doing a lot of research into these structures and how to most effectively gain performance without uh, really blowing up uh, transistor budgets. So it's gonna be interesting to see. Um, next, can't believe I've almost gone 10 minutes just for those three questions. By Chase, do you think that Apple is going to start separating themselves from Intel and making their own processors for their Mac lines, or will they stick with Intel for the foreseeable future? I think it doesn't make sense for them to make their own CPUs for their Mac line. Um, they're selling tons and tons of cell phones. It makes more sense for them to do that because even though their Macs are, are kind of a closed architecture, they're really not, you've still got all kinds of peripherals. Um, they have to worry about more extensive uh, I.O. capabilities than they do with the iPhone. And so, you know, focusing on an SOC where you're making most of your money versus 
hey, let's just keep buying from, from Intel, and hey, let's maybe ask them to put some AMD graphic silicon on there at the same time so we can we can do Mac stuff as well. Um, I, yeah, I don't foresee them uh, anytime in the next five to seven years doing anything. After that, who knows? But uh, for, until then, it's just, you know, they've made the transition before from the old Motorola chips to PowerPC and then PowerPC to x86. And so they're not afraid to do those things. I mean, it's still a major undertaking, but Apple has, you know, done it in the past and, and it's, you know, not a big thing for them. People tend to buy their products again and have no problems with it. So uh, for the time being, I think they're going to stick with Intel and, uh, and uh, just keep the PC ecosystem that they call the Mac intact for the time being. And do BMF. What is the cheapest racing wheel you would still recommend for a PC? Probably the Thrustmaster T150 or the TMX. Or another option is the uh, Logitech. The price on the G29 and G920 have now gone below 250 bucks. So if you're looking at sub 200, then the T150 and the TMX are, are good options. They're not great, but they they're good for for the price. And if you're looking at the two hundred twenty five dollar range, if if you're willing to go up that higher, uh, then you're going to get a heck of a wheel with the G twenty nine. Uh, you know, it's got a leather rim. It's it's got a lot more metal parts, a little bit stronger, or you know, right in the same area. Of those so those would be about the ones that I would go with at the very lowest. Uh, you get below that, you get some strange things uh, you're going to get the, the the passive wheels maybe with a little bit of rumble to them but otherwise you know they're they're budgie cords in there and uh, you lose a lot of the experience and feeling by doing that and i think it it certainly is smarter for you and will be more fun for you if you had a force a full force feedback wheel so those are those are three good options for the price Stick Beater, what racing games or any other games are you looking forward to this year? You know, I haven't purchased Project Cars 2 yet. I'm, I'm maybe waiting to see if that's going to go on sale. I kind of outraced myself a bit last year and I haven't picked it back up yet. Um, but that looks interesting. Looks nice. Um, I still haven't played uh, Forza 7. I guess that's quite a bit of fun and again uh, the graphics are are nice um, trying to think what else is is kinda coming up uh, I've never gotten into the F1 series uh, Dirt 4 was only released just what, last June so it's gonna be a while till we see uh, kinda more rally racing um, the WRC 7 is that the latest or 8 coming up you know I may jump into one of those but I guess that they're a little bit more arcadey than uh, than what was my you know favorite dirt rally, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. What do you think? Zabajnik. 4K monitors are slowly but surely gaining mainstream traction, but scaling in Windows still sucks. Why do you think that it is taking Microsoft so long to properly address this issue? PS 999. Uh, 4K monitors are gaining quite a bit of traction. You can get one for like less than 300 bucks with one of those uh, kind of, you know, it's, it's a TN panel, but it's the nicest TN panel you'll probably ever see. Um, I don't know why Microsoft and Windows 10 does uh, scaling in Windows as poorly as it does. Um, you know, Apple certainly seems to have it down pat on uh, both their Macs and, and their handheld stuff, but I'm not sure why it's taking them so long. Maybe they just have so many graphics guys that they're trying to work with to, to get scaling right that uh, it just, I don't know, it's, it's, is it Sisyphus uh, pushing that boulder up the hill and keeps falling down with changes? I, I don't know. So, yeah, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, attack of the 21st, Josh, why aren't you at CES? Because Ryan's mean. No, he's not mean. He invited me about a month and a half ago, and uh, I said I'll have to see what I can do because uh, I had some vacation coming up with my family, and uh, looking back at the malware 
warnings that we've had in this past week is probably good that I passed. But yeah, I just had too much work at my regular job to uh, be able to go to CES. But you know, they've they've gone to some nice dinners there, and I've missed them. Alan had some steak thing that just looked amazing, and I had lasagna. I hate him. Anyway, Lo Locotas, when can we expect more joshtech.com exclusive content? That's going to have to be me getting off my ass. Uh, the past year has been crazy outside of PC Per. I wish I could have spent a lot more time uh, writing, doing videos, whatever, but Ryan has been incredibly patient with me and uh, my lack of productivity and uh, hopefully we can address that here soon things are already looking up a little better this year but uh, keep your fingers crossed and uh, maybe we'll do something fun here soon Metallus Mueller regarding the final question in last week's mailbag do it Josh shake that booty I'm not gonna shake that booty it's maybe one day I want to run for office and someone will get a hold of this video and see me shake my booty and it's just it's it's gonna just submarine my career not like I haven't submarine my career through any of the other podcasts that we possibly have watched through the years and that's pretty much it uh, 18 minutes or so on on this monstrosity um, thought I'd talk a little bit longer, but some of the other uh, questions in the latter part were not as in depth. But um, fun things coming out of uh, CES. Uh, I don't think that there's as many interesting monitors as I was hoping. I mean, there are some, but I mean, you know, kind of my wish list of things would be 144 hertz, HDR, ultra widescreen with G-Sync, all for under $500. Nobody has anything quite like that. Now, there are some FreeSync uh, monitors out there, and I think there's a new Korean one called Crossover that uh, they put out a 27-inch, 144-hertz uh, FreeSync monitor. It was like a 1440p, or it was an ultra-wide. I can't remember which one, but... One of those two, and it was only 299 somebody was offering that for. And that was a smoking deal, and that went that went quick. People bought those puppies out, and uh, I would like to try something like that. Uh, you know, I've got a three-monitor setup at home. They're 12 years old. Maybe even more, but, um, yeah, they need upgraded really, really badly. I would like to get G-Sync. I've got a couple of NVIDIA cards. I don't have any AMD cards around lately. No Vega around here, otherwise I would uh, do FreeSync, but yeah, getting a hold of any AMD card is, is just not a whole lot of fun. I mean, you save it on the FreeSync, it's 100 to $200 less per panel than G-Sync, but uh, I'd still like to have the G-Sync experience. So anyhow, that is our mailbag. There's my proselytizing, editorializing at the end. I hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, we will see you again next week. Mm -hmm.